All right, welcome back to the Fast Money Halftime Report. Yeah. We are welcoming in Eric Sprott now. He is CEO of Sprott Asset Management. Before we get to uh, your investing uh, strategy, I want to take a look at what's happening in commodities. Obviously, you're a big player in the commodity space, but take a look at, you know, gold today is uh, down below 1,600. Uh, you've got oil barely uh, hanging on to, to 96 bucks. So it's an interesting uh, story in the commodities market today, given those concerns about global growth, Pete what you're seeing in commodities. Absolutely, and I, I look at some of these commodity names right now and I find them very, very interesting and actually quite, a, in many cases, I think appealing because the sell-off has been so harsh. I mean, we're talking about looking for opportunities. It's not just in some of the broad sectors of the market like you're talking about technology, maybe it's financials, I'm not seeing it in the financials, but certainly when you look at some of these commodities, the way they've been sold off, whether you're looking over in the copper space, I think there's some great opportunities, as well as in the Met Coal, where they continue to pound on it, but at some level, it's seems to me that it gets very, very attractive from the global perspective. Yeah, let's let's switch and talk to gold uh, now with with uh, with Eric Sprott because you have made it really the central theme of your investing thesis. Right, gold is is down today. It's been performing weird uh, yeah. lately. I think you'd agree with that, and yes. maybe I think that's an appropriate word. Yeah, uh, as well. I want to read something that you said uh, in April. Uh, of this year. I would have thought that with Europe teetering on the brink of bankruptcy, it would have had been good for gold, but for some reason, gold has been under pressure. So clearly that statement could be made today yes. and it would hold true. Uh, last year was a difficult year for you in that strategy. We know what happened with gold towards the end of the year. Right. Why is now all of a sudden going to be different if sure. the same thing you said a month ago right. could be said as sure. we sit here today sure. at Salt? Well, Scott, I think you have to go back to how we got into the crisis. Uh, you know, I think we had an over-levered banking system. I'm going back to the, the NASDAQ crash, if you will. And um, really, when the Lehman event uh, indicated the over-leverage of the financial system. Uh, its uh, liquidation created nothing but chaos. And subsequently, the powers that be, whether it's the ECB or the Fed or the Bank of Japan, have made uh, every attempt not to let this thing unravel. Um, and therefore, people on the surface can't maybe see what the underlying problems are. Um, but we had the Greece failure. I would suggest that with Spanish yields uh, over 6%, it might be the next one to fall. And I always go back to if you were in Greece or you're in Ireland or you're in Argentina one time, would you have been taking your money out of the bank and would you have purchased gold? And I have to believe it's happening. We have some wonderful statistics on physical gold purchases which argue very strongly for the price of gold to go up. Why isn't gold up today? On, on, a, on a day like this when there was so much seeming yeah. fear right. in the market, right. you would typically think that you would see yeah. a flight to gold yeah. as you're seeing a flight to treasuries, you see the 10-year yield falling. Right. What's going on? Well, I, I think it's counterintuitive. Uh, gold normally doesn't go up when things are the most extreme. When we had the LTR announcement on Feb 29th, it got crashed, uh, which seemed uh, somewhat counterintuitive. I mean, I'm going to fall back on Jim Grant's statement here on CNBC when he said, you know, all markets are manipulated, and we know the credit markets are manipulated. I suspect that uh, central banks that are fighting this contagion out there don't like gold going up. So I, I think it's always somewhat counterintuitive. The people who sell paper gold and paper silver can rule the markets over the short term. But I think in the long run, the physical participants will win the day. So you're not deviating at all from, no. from your strategy. And, and I should note, uh, for all of you uh, watching this conversation, that uh, Mr. Sprott has made a 17.1% annualized return since the inception of the fund in 2002. So clearly your strategy has worked. You've right. had some ups and some downs, yeah. clearly. But you're, you're not changing your, your strategy no. at all. In no. fact, you've, you've called silver the investment of the next decade. Correct. Correct. I'll tell you why I haven't changed my mind on gold, first of all. I mean, there was a data point that came out yesterday where the exports of gold from Hong Kong into mainland China went up 600% year over year in the month of uh, March. Uh, in the last nine months, really ever since LTRO started, the Chinese have been buying massive amounts of gold. Most people wouldn't recognize the significance of 64 tons, but if I told you that mine supply, ex-China and ex-Russia, because none of that ever makes the market, is only 2,200 tons a year, when all of a sudden you buy 64 tons in a month, that's a significant part of the mining market. And I was a little surprised that gold reacted negatively yesterday, because I think the physical data is overwhelmingly in favor of gold. Year-end target for gold is what? 
Well, I think it'll mind. go over 2000 by year end. And silver? I think it'll go back over $50 by year end. Well, I'd love to broaden the conversation and, and just get your thoughts, both Pete and, and Pierre, on what, what you're hearing here. I don't know what, what sort of position or what your view is, is on metals, on gold in general, Pierre. Well, I think I, I don't have a very strong view on gold, but what I can observe is that it's a little bit like the S&P movement today, for instance. People are hiding in there. A lot of people are buying gold because they're scared and they're hiding in there. And if you ask them much more how to legitimate what they're buying, they don't really have a clue. And um, at the same time, a lot of the reason why they're scared is that um, you know, you're going to get inflation from the action of the central bank. When you look at the output gap and you look at the severity of you know, the destruction of large parts of economic growth, this is not today's battle. And yes, of course, we have to look at tomorrow's battle as well, but that's really been pushed uh, a couple of years further out. And we first have to deal with a deflationary situation of uh, spiraling down European economy and a slowing down world economy before we deal with the worries about inflation. So that removes a lot of the attraction of buying something that has had quite a lot of momentum in terms of uh, ETFs and everybody piling up in it. It's a very intuitive uh, reaction. Let, let, let's also throw out the fact that I, I'm sure, Eric, over, over the last few days, you heard the comments or at least read them of what Warren Buffett and others said on, on CNBC. Uh, they're not fans of gold. No. Not, neither is Charlie Munger, neither no. is Bill Gates. Right. But I find it really interesting, particularly with those three gentlemen making that comment. Gold was the investment of the last decade. It blew away any investment you could make, including Microsoft and Berkshire Hathaway, probably by a factor of 500%. So in other words, they missed the trade, big time. Uh, I don't know that I should respect their opinion at this point in time. I think all the evidence points to uh, reasons to own gold. And yes, you can look at it as a non-interest paying asset. Gold went up 17% a year for 12 years now. Uh, yes, it's in a bit of a funk at the present time. The year's not over. And the evidence seems to mount that the physical buyers are prepared to take the metal off the system. We had central banks come in and buy something like uh, 58 tons in the month of February, way beyond what they bought the year before. And I might mention these are non-G6 central banks. And I always believe there's unintended consequences to everything. And when the G6 had their unlimited swaps and you had the LTRO and the th threat to print money, if you're not a G6 member but you're looking in, what are you thinking? What are you thinking of what's going on here? Do you really want to own a U.S. bond yielding 2% when they're printing money? Do you want to own a, a European bond when you realize the banking system is falling apart? And those non-G6 central banks have stepped up buying, as has China. Pete, we talk about the SLV, we right. talk about the GLD on a daily basis. Your thoughts? We talk about it all the time. Last year we sat here at the SALT conference and the SLV was pushing at those very upper levels and accelerated to the upside. What is it right now about silver that excites you so much, sure. that gets you onto that bandwagon? And also, is the SLV the proper instrument to use, or is there something else that you'd be using actually to trade silver? You have an instrument I'm, as I'm well, right? Now you're going to be talking. Your, now he's going to be talking his book. Just curious, because, sir. Because, or maybe you're setting me up. Thank you very much. But we have our own trust, the PSLV, uh, which where the asset is in Canada. It's held by the Royal Canadian Mint, and people can exchange those trust units for the actual silver, and it, it has tax advantages over the SLV. So obviously, I have to recommend that. Why do I think that silver will outperform gold? I look at uh, two or three metrics that su suggest that to me. As an example, last year, the U.S. Mint sold as many dollars of silver coins as, as gold coins. Same dollar amount. In other words, people bought 50 times more physical silver than gold. Um, when we did our last two tranches of the PHYS, our gold trust, and PSLV, or silver trust, both of them raised $349 million. We bought 50 times more silver than gold. We don't force people to buy these things. That's their decision. I don't force people to buy coins at the U.S. Mint. That's their decision. So if the common guy is going to buy silver in a ratio of 50 to 1 to gold, but it's only available at 6.5 to 1, I have to believe the price of silver is going to outperform gold. Yep. All right, more with Eric Sprott on the other side of this break, including the areas he's short in the market. And later, as the yield on the 10-year cracks 1.8%, BlackRock's Rick Reeder will show you how he's playing it. More halftime report live from Salt in Vegas is next. The halftime report is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. Turn here.
Ken, from Jacques Attali, the former president of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, could not have been more stark. He said the real question is, will the euro still exist by Christmas? The world has never been through a collapse of a common currency as widely used as the euro. And uncertainty about that is one reason the price of gold keeps going up and why this past week Canadians bought up $600 million worth of it when the Royal Mint offered it for sale. When people get worried about the future of paper money, gold is considered a safe haven. Canadians haven't been the only ones buying up gold lately. After 20 years of selling their gold reserves, central banks around the world have abruptly reversed course, adding 150 metric tons of gold to their currency reserves in only three months. With the euro in crisis and the U.S. failing to come up with a debt reduction plan, central banks are buying gold as a hedge. Which country central banks are doing it is a closely held secret. But we know the U.S. keeps a lot of its foreign reserves in gold. So does Germany. Other countries backstop their paper money with very little gold. Canada doesn't have a gold reserve anymore to back our dollar. We sold it a decade ago. Well, Eric Sprott has been named Canada's top financial visionary this year. He's respected worldwide for his opinions on gold and silver and investing. He's attending the 10th anniversary of the business school at Carleton University, which bears his name. Uh, Mr. Sprott, does the fact that Canada holds no gold reserves to back its currency anymore put it in any greater risk uh, with all the money that's being printed around the world right now? Well, I don't think anybody's gold reserves are adequate enough to solve the system. I mean, if I take all the gold reserves in the world, they probably represent... Um, maybe one-tenth of all the money in the world. So there's no way you can back the currencies with gold. Uh, it's unfortunate that Canada, uh, back in the early 2000s, sold all their gold. And um, I, of course, would not have recommended that. And I would recommend even today that the, uh, the government, the Treasury, or the Bank of Canada should own gold. Well, right now, our reserves are backed by the U.S. dollar, which is backed by gold. Uh, the Bank of Canada Governor Mark Carney this month insisted that paper money isn't going anywhere, but as you well know, the euro looks to be in uh, pretty serious jeopardy this weekend. Yes. So down the road, could our currency be in trouble without gold reserves? Well, uh, Kevin, I take a, a pretty broad view when it comes to gold, and you know, my own view is that the market has already made gold the reserve currency. The market has, not the central banks, not the governments. And... Um, uh, ultimately, I think these currencies are going to be, have to be backed by something tangible, which really means gold and silver. So the fact that we don't have any gold puts us in a, a, a weakened position. So um, I think it would be important for us to reestablish those reserves. Uh, a lot of people would have noticed that a lot of central banks are buying gold now. The IMF just came out with, uh, sorry, the World Gold Council just came out with a study saying that, you know, um, central banks bought something like 148 tons of gold in the third quarter, which is an unprecedented amount. And I'm sure that was spread amongst, uh, you know, five to ten different central banks. I would have loved our central bank to be one of them. But the fact it didn't, is there value in buying it up now? Well, I think it would have lots of value, um, but it's not going to have... A, a, a significant proportion of value when you're going up against countries that already have, let's say, 10% uh, of their currency backed by gold, and we're starting at zero. So it would take a lot for us to get to even 10% back, and that'd be a huge commitment we'd have to make. At its current price? Years. Uh, years. <laughs> well, you've been saying for months now that Europe's banking system is worse off than anyone is willing to admit. And uh, as you know, this past week, five, maybe six big central banks, ours included, flushed the system with cheap credit and moved reserves among themselves. Uh, what did that tell you about the health of Europe's banks right now? These central bank things don't come out for no reason. Uh, I mean, there's rumors floating around that some banks were ready to go, uh, European banks. And that's why this coordinated response took place. And I can fully imagine that that is what's happening. And one of the things I do monitor is the amount of money that these European banks are borrowing from the ECB. And the last report a week, they borrowed something like $18 billion in a week. And there's only one reason banks have to borrow from the ECB, and that's because that's money deposits are leaving, and they, they, they either can't sell an asset, which they probably can't, and therefore they have to go to the central bank to, um, to pay off the depositor. Mr. Sprott, thanks for joining us. Kevin, all the best. Thank you.
It's near zero. Where can you find value in a low to no yield environment? Joining us now is Eric Sprott, CEO and CIO at Sprott Asset Management. His main hedge fund has a long, short equity strategy with $10 billion in assets. Over 80% of his fund is allocated uh, in precious metals. And uh, is there anyone that likes QE3 more than you, Eric? Uh, I don't think anybody has quite the concentration that we have, Joe. But we're happy to have it, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we're happy to have the concentration and happy to have uh, uh, QE3. Um, at this point, I, I, do you ever take off some positions when, when you've gotten what you wanted? Haven't you gotten most of what you wanted already? And, and, and aren't you thinking about maybe standing to the side or no? Well, Joe, uh, it's interesting. I go back to uh, the reason I got in gold was, into gold was in 2000. And uh, at that time, there was some wonderful work done on the gold the supply-demand uh, market by a guy named uh, Frank Veneroso. And he basically suggested there would be a shortage of physical silver in that year. And he wrote a book called The 1998 Gold Book. And um, because the NASDAQ had gone down um, and we ran then only long, only funds, I thought, well, where can we kind of hide out here? And I thought gold was the obvious answer and precious metals generally. And um, it, you might be surprised to realize that the... Uh, the gold stocks since the uh, 2000 bottom are up something like 1,500%. Uh, uh, gold is up 600%. And in a way, I call it the great wealth re redistribution because those who have invested in gold and silver uh, have prospered uh, quite nicely. Uh, to your question whether I want to stay with the trade, uh, the reason I would stay with the trade, and you mentioned QE3, um, I never would have imagined when I got involved in gold that I would have the benefit of kind of irresponsible money printing, uh, bank runs that are ongoing, as we've witnessed in the various countries in Europe. And those two ingredients, along with the QE3, which has been announced, I think will be a huge tailwind for, uh, for gold, uh, gold and other precious metals to go higher. You also... Um point out that, I, I, that central banks save the big banks and that the financial system at this point, in your view, it, I mean, it might have been a temporary save, right? I mean, we're, we're still, we still have a lot of, of risk that could come in the next few years, and, and gold answers uh, your need for, uh, for covering your uh, strategy there, right? Sure. Well, I mean, I go back to, I think, one of the fundamental problems we faced in the last decade was the over-leveraging of the banks which culminated in the failure of Lehman Brothers and uh, essentially the failure of many other uh, companies but uh, they weren't allowed or weren't, weren't forced to liquidate. Lehman was uh, the one time that someone's been forced to liquidate and we saw what nearly happened as a result of it. You know, we've had many other um, companies that one way or another were either taken over, bailed out, Fannie, Freddie, AIG, various banks around the world, the Spanish banks, the Greek banks. Now we do it with governments. And I think all of those things suggest that uh, the financial system is quite destabilized. And um, I, I agree with uh, Governor Plosser of the Fed that um, QE3 is not likely to work, just as QE1 and QE2 didn't work. When we look back at you know, where we were and where we are, and we've had all this printing and all this deficit creation, and you know, we really have accomplished nothing. In fact, we've gone into reverse in terms of job losses and numbers of homes sold in the year and cars sold in the year. So I don't see the, uh, the QE3 as being uh, substantive in terms of helping the economy. Eric, it's Neil Kashkari. As you, as a big gold investor, how do you think about the future of inflation? At PIMCO, we're always debating, is the future 3% inflation? Is it 4% inflation? With all this money printing in the US and in Europe, there's a risk it's higher than that. Do you have a view? Sure. Well, Neil, thank you for the question, and I, I find it rather interesting. I, I read Bill Gross's articles, and I could see, going back to May, that looked like Bill was uh, shifting his stance somewhat when he, in that May article, suggested, you know, maybe real assets are a better investment, and subsequently he said, well, he wasn't sure about stocks, and he wasn't sure about bonds, and, you know, he's tweeted that maybe gold is a buy. And I think that uh, inflation is likely to heat up. I mean, I think it's continually underreported. For the average person in the 99%, I don't think they believe for one second that inflation is 2%. And I think that uh, as incomes aren't going up by that much, the whole 99% is under extreme pressure here. I think it creates more stress on governments and the banking system ultimately. And you want to have your 
your assets in something that's that's real that can benefit by the debasement of currencies that's basically going on in uh, all the developed world's central banks. Larry? Uh, the, the, the real question is timing. Um, you know, when do you think this is all going to come apart? I mean, the, the end game has got to be that you can't print money to get yourself out of a problem. But you can print money for quite a while. So uh, yeah. is this going to go on for one year, two years, six months, or ten years? Yeah. Well, it's a great question. And uh, when you ask the question, when do you think it's going to fall apart? I mean, I probably would have thought it would have fallen apart many years ago. Uh, but I never would have imagined that we would have bought into money printing. I mean, it just seems rather extreme to me that as investors we accept it as a palliative to the situation, which it certainly is not. So um, we can keep the markets void. I think uh, Chairman Bernanke basically measures himself by how he deals with the stock market and how he deals with the housing market. Uh, they have been kept up here by the hope that something's going to happen, but I think when you re review the results of QE1 and QE2 post QE1 and 2, you realize that the market gets into a bit of a funk. Maybe we're in that funk here right now that we kind of have come to grips with the fact that yes, it's been announced, but maybe it won't do anything because most of what's being done is to help the financial system, not necessarily the uh, the man on the street. And we talked about some dire stuff earlier, uh, Eric. I, guess, I, I we we're not predicting that, but I guess. Uh, there's a, a certain probability to, to some really frightening things happening within the next 10, 15 years, I, I, I guess. Well, Joe, I mean, I would say there's been frightening things happening for quite a while here. I mean, I mean really Lehman. frightening. Like we're, we're used to, <laughs> we're used to, you know, we don't worry about shelter that much anymore, food that much, yeah. safety that much. We, we have a yeah. society that we think can't go back to. Right. You know, uh, you know, decades ago, and and maybe right. maybe sometimes, uh, you know, we assume we can go to the supermarket and buy all the food we want. Right. Well, quite frankly, I don't re really, I don't often go there. I mean, it's it's you know, know that it's a worry, and I'm more interested in the investment field and what we do about it as investors. Yeah. Well, hopefully, you'll be able uh, to go right. buy with 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 the money you make. Hopefully, you'll be able to go buy a store that actually has those things, uh, you know, and and not get uh, killed on the way to the store. Uh, I, I see what you're saying. We, it's there's, there's a time and place for for that, but you know, with gold bugs, we always got to ask that question because I know you guys all got the you know the holes in the backyard and all the bottled water and everything. So I know you're ready if something does happen, right? Well, um, I think you have to be prepared for reality, <laughs> and, and you know. Well, uh, and when we see what's going on in the world, I mean, it's it's you can, one can hardly argue that uh, uh, prudence is uh, is very it. much warranted here. I, so. I, I made the mistake of watching the road with uh, with the uh, what's he a Vigo uh, Mortensen, and uh, I'm petrified. I, I'm you, I'm going to go take karate and, and carry around about a gun and two thousand yeah. dollars worth of gold everywhere I go. Eric, thank you. Right. I appreciate.